So next up is Phil Simon, who is an author of some awesome books and also a Rush fanboy. So I'm very excited. Okay, I'm Phil. I've written four books. I also do some speaking. And for the first time tonight, I actually get to talk about my favorite band in public. But over the last 15 years, I've literally talked hundreds of times about sexual harassment. When I was in grad school, I talked about labor economics to a bunch of incredibly bored undergraduates. I started teaching software classes when I was a consultant. But tonight, for the first time, I get to talk about Rush. Now, for those of you who don't know, Rush is a Canadian power trio that has sold more than 40 million albums. The first of which was released in 1974, and the band has stayed together for 38 years, and they actually like each other. How are we doing? All right? We're good? Okay. So Rush is comprised of three members. They're all really fantastic musicians. You have Alex Lifeson on guitar. You have Neil Peart on the drums. He also writes the lyrics. And then Gaddy Lee does the singing, plays the bass, and the keyboards. And I want to talk about how Rush has inspired me, particularly over the last two or three years as I started writing books. So I want to take you back to April of 2010. And I've done two books, they've done reasonably well, and I reached out to my publisher because I wanted to write a book about small businesses using emerging technologies in really interesting ways. And I had two publishers who were really interested. However, we disagreed on a number of things, like the price of the book, when the book would come out, the marketing of the book. Now, I don't have to tell anyone in this room that if you're writing about technology, this stuff changes instantly, right? Waiting 18 months or so for a book to come out, to me, it's just insanity, right? If you're writing about the history of Las Vegas, 1920, 1930, who cares? But if you're writing about technology, there's something that could be dated in six months. So I thought about my decision. Would I wind up doing this book and making these compromises? Patience and compromise don't really sit too well with me. It's just a general rule. Or do I just not do the book? And I thought about what Rush did in 1975. So on the last tour, they called it the Time Machine Tour. I want to take it back to 1975 when I was really, really young. Rush had done really well with its first two albums. It was opening for Kiss. The band had wound up playing in front of 15, 20,000 people. But when Rush released its third album, Caress the Steel, the album just tanked. Crickets. People didn't like it. Two of the songs were over 15 minutes long. Radio stations wouldn't play it back when people thought that radio stations still matter. And it was really a problem. And this was a real blow to the band, because the band was so proud of this album. They were reaching, they were creating the kind of music that they wanted to create. But people weren't really picking it up. So Rush had a decision to make. Okay. The record company at the time, Mercury, basically said we're dropping these guys, right? Because record companies don't really care about the quality of music, they care about making money. Right? So Rush's manager got on a plane and flew to Mercury Records and begged the record company to give them one more chance. And the record company said to them, okay, but we want shorter songs, we want it to be commercially viable, we want the radio to embrace this, so no more of this 20 minute nonsense. And the manager, Ray Daniels, just said, that's fine, we'll do whatever you want. And Ray went back to the band, and Ray's heart was in the right place. And he said to the guys, you know, I really want you guys to be successful, but these are the changes you have to make. So what did Rush do? They said, you know what? No freaking way. If we're going out, we're going out on our terms, baby. And Rush released in 1976 a phenomenal album. They decided not to compromise. They released an album called 2112. The title track of this album chimes in at over 20 minutes long. And this album resonated with people. The sense of oppression that the band felt resonated through the music, and it really echoed with people. And this album wound up selling over a million copies. So Rush decided to be successful on its own terms. And even if they didn't wind up being successful, they were okay with that because they were doing it the way they wanted to do it. So let's turn it back to me for a second. Back in April and May of 2010, what was my decision? I said, you know what? I believe in what I'm doing. So screw it. I'm going to start my own publishing company. So I found a professional cover designer, I found an editor, I found a book designer, I found an indexer. And I wound up putting out my third book, The New Small, six months ahead of what the publisher wanted to do. 
And I actually want to give one away with a little bit of a trivia contest tonight, so I may go over my allotted time. Denny Lee of Rush is a big fan of what sport? Whoever says it gets an autographed copy of the book. Now, as I was reading Delivering Happiness in preparation for this, a quote from Tony Shea actually echoes the same sentiment. And it was talk he was talking about when he starting Zappos. Even if Zappos failed, we would know that we did everything we could to chase a dream we believed in. And it's the same kind of sentiment that drives me. Now, fast forward to May of 2011, I moved out to, uh, I visited Vegas with the intent of possibly moving here. And I had this idea for a book. I'd just written a book about small businesses and what they did to be successful. And I often think about, as a small business owner, what I would do if I absolutely had to work for a large company. Which company would it be and why? And without even thinking, I said to myself, the respect is Apple's, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. These companies are just killing it. Yes, they've got cool technology and I'm a big geek, but they are doing things in terms of building a platform that no one else has done before. So I started writing and I was about 20, 30,000 words into the manuscript. And I was doing really well and I was really excited about the book. And as I said before, I'm not patient. So I reached out to a new publisher. And this publisher had a different model. They were brand new. They weren't trying to sort of fit into a, a legacy model. And I said to them, okay, let's, you know, let's do the book. And they said, yeah, we're really interested. We think you have a great idea. When will the book come out? And what's today, May 15th? They basically wanted the book out now. So it was the same decision. So like I did with the last book, I went to Kickstarter. Anyone ever heard of Kickstarter.com? Yeah. Most people, okay. And I raised the money myself. And again, I hired the same people. And this book came out October 22nd, so seven months ahead of what this publisher wanted to do. And I'm going to give one away. So the guitarist, Alex Lifeson, this is a little bit trickier. You can't answer it. <laughs> He's actually not named Alex Lifeson. His real name is what? <laughs> okay, nobody knows it. No one wants to Google it, huh? It's actually Ziva Yinovich, but let's do this. Alex is pretty good at one sport. What is it? I heard golf. So we'll give it to you later. So we, the exit, the warrior will exit right now, but I hope that I have inspired you half as much as Rush has inspired me. Thank you.